Ladies and gentlemen of the press, fellow Ghanaians, first of all, we would like to express our profound gratitude to all Ghanaians for the overwhelming show of love and support throughout our period of incarceration over our protest against Galamse and promise to always fight for Ghana whenever the need arises. That being said, we express our outrage and condemnation of the recent unfortunate statements made by Dr. Matthew Opoku Prempe, Kobna E. Japong, Maxwell Kofi Juma, and Dr. Ayu Efriye regarding the rampant issue of illegal mining or Galamse. Their comments reflect an alarming arrogance of power that prioritizes personal and political gain over the health and safety of our environment and communities. Dr. Poku Prempe's assertion that the MPP will not impose a ban on illegal mining reveals a shocking disregard for the overwhelming evidence of environmental devastation caused by such practices. His proposal to empower small-scale miners while ignoring the pervasive illegality and distraction associated with Galamse showcases a complete disconnect from the realities faced by Ghanaians. This misguided approach prioritizes profit over sustainable practices and endangers our natural resources for future generations. Kobina Japan's dismissal of protests against illegal mining as politically motivated is not only arrogant, but deeply insulting to the countless Ghanaians affected by the destruction of their livelihoods and environment. His callous suggestion that demonstrators should protest at Galamse sites shows his deep-seated ignorance of the fact that all the relevant governmental institutions and agencies per Article 257 that have the power to address Galamse directly are here in Accra. It is a blatant attempt to deflect criticisms while ignoring the urgent pleas of citizens for action against this national crisis. Dr. Ayu Efriye's claim that the government has no intention of banning illegal mining, fearing political backlash, underscores a troubling prioritization of party interests over public health and safety. His allegations that the opposition is to blame for the current crisis serve as a desperate distraction from the MPP's own negligence in addressing this present issue. Unfortunately and regretfully, he is the chairman of Parliament's Health Committee. The health of our water bodies and the well-being of our people should never be compromised for political expediency. Maxwell Kofi Juma's recent threat to dismiss any Jayhawk Distilleries Limited employee who participates in a nationwide strike is not only alarming, but also undermines the fundamental rights of workers to express their concerns and advocate for better conditions. In a democratic society, the right to strike is a crucial component of labor relations, allowing workers to voice their grievances collectively. Juma's assertion that the issues raised by organized labor do not pertain to GHOC fails to recognize the interconnected nature of labor rights and the broader economic conditions that are impact all employees. Threatening employees with termination of their employment for exercising their right to protest is an egregious overreach of authority. Such actions can create a climate of fear, stifling open dialogue and employee engagement. These so-called leaders, collective failure to address the devastating impacts of Galamse, demonstrates a gross neglect of their duty to protect the environment and the welfare of Ghanaians. Their actions and statements reflect a disturbing trend of greed and self-interest, prioritizing financial gain over the survival of our communities and ecosystems. Ghana Water Company Limited has had to reduce water supply by about 75% and has warned we may have to import water soon. How many Ghanaians can afford to buy bottled water today? And how many of us can pay for imported water? If human beings can live only three days without water, we are literally on the verge of a mass death sentence. We call upon the good people of Ghana to recognize this negligence for what it is, an affront to our collective health, safety, and future. The time for accountability is now. We will not allow those in power to continue prioritizing their interests over the well-being of the nation. It is with deep disappointment and growing frustration 
that we, the concerned citizens of Ghana, address the glaring failure of President Nana Dodanko Akufuado to uphold his solemn promise to combat illegal mining, known as Galamse. His impassioned declaration of readiness to put his presidency on the line now rings hollow as the very environmental and societal issues he vowed to address have worsened under his watch. For years, we have watched as rivers dry up, landscapes are ravaged, and the health of our communities deteriorates, all while the government's commitment to ending Galamse fades into empty rhetoric. The president's failure to act decisively against the legal mining industry, rife with corruption and environmental destruction, showcases a complete abdication of responsibility. His words, once filled with fervor and moral clarity, have become mere platitudes devoid of any substantive action or accountability. It is abundantly clear that President Akufuado has not only failed to protect our natural resources, but has also betrayed the trust of the very people who elected him. The silence in the face of ongoing devastation speaks volumes about his administration's priorities. We cannot stand by while our nation's heritage and future are squandered. His inability to deliver on his promises to safeguard Ghana's environment is a dent on his leadership or lack thereof. A man of honor would step aside immediately. However, if he chooses to remain in power, we will unite and mobilize the strength of the Ghanaian people with the lessons of Kumi Preko to hold him accountable. The time for empty promises is over. It is time for decisive action. Ghanaians deserve better. We will not allow our voices to be silenced, and we will not accept continued neglect of our nation's welfare. The fight against Galamse is not just a political issue. It is a matter of survival for our environment, our health, and our future generations. We call upon all Ghanaians to join us in demanding accountability and change. Enough is enough. The people would no longer tolerate the erosion of our rights and our resources. The recent launch of Operation Halt 2 by the government of Ghana involving the use of deadly force against citizens is a deeply concerning escalation in the ongoing battle against Galamse. This violent approach threatens the safety and well-being of our citizens and raises serious ethical questions about governance in our country. Galamse operations can yield significant financial returns, with some individuals reportedly earning up to 5,000 CDs per week. However, resorting to violence will not address the root causes of this illegal activity. Instead, we advocate for sustainable solutions, such as providing alternative livelihoods and engaging in meaningful dialogue with affected communities. The government's goal for oil policy has been a significant factor contributing to the increased incidence of Galamse in Ghana. Instead of stabilizing the economy, this initiative has intensified illegal mining activities and fueled unrest within affected communities. By creating a system that links gold extraction to oil procurement, the policy has inadvertently incentivized more individuals to engage in Galamse as a means of economic survival. As a result, we are witnessing a troubling rise in illegal mining, which not only jeopardizes our environment, but also endangers the lives of those involved. To effectively combat Galamse, it is crucial that the government re-evaluates this policy and focuses on sustainable alternatives that provide viable livelihoods for those impacted by the economic challenges of mining. Dialogue, education, and community engagement must take precedence over violence and coercive measures. We call on the government to repeal the gold for oil policy and adopt a more thoughtful, inclusive approach that addresses the root causes of illegal mining while prioritizing the safety and well-being of our citizens. We urge the government to prioritize peaceful community-driven strategies that promotes economic stability while respecting human rights. It is imperative that we address the underlying issues of Galamse through persuasion and collaboration rather than violence. The silence of the paid opposition, the NDC, and their flag bearer is not at all surprising. 
They have proven to be the most useless opposition in the political history of Ghana, with no clear plan to use their numerical strength in parliament in the interest of Ghana. For someone who signed off 75% of Ghana's bauxite reserves in the forest near Nyinehin in the Etrima in Ponyua district to his brother on December 29, 2016, that's barely eight days to handing over power, Mr. Muhammad lacks the moral right to speak against illegal mining, and we take special notice of these developments. Fellow Ghanaians, it is increasingly clear that the people we are asking to fix the country cannot, will not, and do not know how to fix the country. The time has come for us, the youth, to rise to the occasion to take on the responsibility of rescuing and rebuilding our nation, Ghana. We will make no further demands except accountability. We hereby invite each and every concerned citizen, organized groups and associations from civil society, and the diaspora, teachers, artists, students, medical practitioners, market women, lawyers, drivers, farmers, entrepreneurs, and of course, the streets. Whoever you are, let us take a coordinated stand in our efforts in the interest of our motherland. Let us be the change that we seek. Unity of purpose is our greatest weapon. God bless our homeland, Ghana, and make her great and strong. Thank you very much. Right, thank you very much. So if you listen to the wedding of our communication so far nationally, we always refer to those engaged in small-scale mining, or to some large extent, yes, as illegal miners. Now, that is an unfair categorization. Most of the people who are operating on a small scale today have licenses and have been licensed or given permits to engage in those mining practices by the same government. So to put all of them under one umbrella and say illegal mining is very unfair, right? Now we're saying, we do not or cannot say who is engaged in illegal mining as a stance and who is engaged in legal mining. We further cannot even say who is engaging in proper legal mining activities and who is not. So our call is this, government should halt all mining activities immediately and then review all the licenses that have been given to all operators within that space. Now, if people are now going to be re-licensed before they can operate any mining lease whatsoever, government can take a very firm stand and make sure they engage in viable practices or sustainable, environmentally sustainable practices before their mining, their mining licenses are given to them. But to put everyone under the umbrella and say they are illegal miners doesn't really get to the root cause of the matter. Now, we're saying we cannot say for certain that all the people who are selling gold to the government come from the PMC. That's what we've been told. But there's not been any accountability to this. So we are saying, even before we take the conversation any further, let us put a stop first to all mining activities currently, and for government to have a review of whoever is engaged in mining. And that's how and only the time that we can decide who is engaging in proper mining activities or otherwise. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, thank you very much. So we've been able to secure certain images from Oliver, however, at a distance, but it shows certain physical damages on his, on his body. If the police are denying any such allegations, why don't they give us access to Oliver so we can ascertain for ourselves closely that none of those things have been true? But even from the images we've been able to take of Oliver, you can see clearly there have been um, um, signs of injuries on his body. The police admitted to that. Yes. Yeah, but uh, you uh, ascertain that they uh, went further to brutalize him. That's what I want you to comment. The police is saying. So why can't we have access to Oliver and then we can ascertain all of these things on the record? But the thing is this we have justifiable cause not to trust the police. A case in, in, in point here would be in court. A police officer gave false account that the people who have been arrested and kept in police custody were fed two times a day with papaya and that he personally supervised the distribution of the food. But then everyone who was in court that day who were behind bars admitted to it that none of those things were true. So it's on record that police have gone to issue false accounts in relation to some of these issues. 
So if the police are denying this, why don't they give us access to Oliver? But as it stands, this morning, none of us has been granted access to Oliver. None of us has been able to even have a conversation with him. So if there's nothing to hide, why does the police not give us access to him so we can lay rest some of these allegations? Uh, Later rest, I mean, yes. yes. No, are you talking about bail or access? Sorry, sorry, it's the bail. Yes. yes they, they need two sureties. Right. And, uh, he's not been able to provide those two. But we're talking about access here. Access here would be able to go visit him in cells. Not to even be... want to just visit him. Just to make sure he's all right. Because ever since this incident, we've not been given access to Oliver. So it is what we have seen and what we're reporting against the word of the police. And I'm telling you on record, police have been on record to have not given accurate testimonies. I don't want to use a strong word, but we know they've lied in certain instances. So we're saying if they are denying anything or any brutality against Oliver, they should just give us access to Oliver and all of these things can be laid to rest. The last question. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Livelihoods, yes. Right. So then again, we are having, we are waging this war as is claimed against illegal miners. But how has it been ascertained who is legal and who is illegal? And of course, the very first instance is not to use violence against our people. These are citizens of Ghana, right? So before you even deploy soldiers to use lethal force against citizens of Ghana. We are saying there are so many other avenues that you have to exhaust before that becomes a last resort. Because mind you, these are Ghanaian citizens who are being killed or who are being chased or, or harmed. And we're saying that is not the immediate resort or response to any situation. Unfortunately, in recent times, we've realized that successive governments, but particularly this government, always quickly resorts to violence as its first means of addressing any situation. How else can you explain on armed protesters who are citizens making demands for certain things to be done. The government sends armed policemen against those people. We're saying violence is not always the first resort. No, it has to be the last resort. But before violence even comes in, why don't we explore other alternatives, which are pro-people, so we can find lasting solutions to Galamse. This is not the first time we're having a military act, um, um, operation against Galamse. Operation Vanguard, Operation Calm Life, all of these things were put in the, in the mix. What was the success rate of these operations? We had lives that have been lost unjustifiably, all in the excuse of fighting some of these issues. But we're saying, yes, let us engage the people through all of this means that we've mentioned. Alternative livelihoods, dialogue and persuasion to get people out of this space before last resort could be the resort to violence. But we are not in support of the police and the, and the armed forces using violence without exploring all these other alternative avenues. You've thrown arrows at um, NDC uh, opposition, yes. uh, saying that he, he has no right, not even a right, he, he doesn't have the moral right. Yes. Moral yes. right. Uh, and he's saying that he's not going to comment on the Galamse menace. Right. Are you saying that he's not going to comment on the Galamse menace? Right. Do you think it's fair to him if he being a citizen of Ghana to comment on the Galamse menace? Right. Do you think it's fair to him if he being a citizen of Ghana? Right. So then I laid a, pre a premise before I made that statement that. On the 29th of December, 2021, the then president, General um, Mahama, His Excellency, actually signed off Ghana's bauxite reserves, that's about 75% of that, to his brother's company, which is called Extin Cubic. Now, these are matters that were sent to the High Court and to the Supreme Court, and there are documents to show that this really occurred. Now, we're saying, if elections were had in Ghana on the 7th of December, 2016, and Mahama lost those elections, and he knew he was on his way out. On the 29th of December, which is less than eight days to he handing over to the next government, he signs off 75% of Ghana's bauxite to his brother's company. That is an illegal activity. So we're saying his silence is not surprising because we're expecting Mr. Mahama to have joined the call or the fight against Galamse, but he has been very quiet. And we are saying we are not surprised at his silence. And we say, we are suggesting that he's silent because he lacks the moral um, the moral justification to even say anything because of the precedence that he has set. And that's why we sought to raise that issue. What's now, next line of thank you very much. Yeah, so we are calling at the end of the press statement, you realize we made a general call to several sectors of the Ghanaian economy or the Ghanaian populace. We're calling on all civil societies, we're calling on every sector of the economy, particularly the Ghanaian youth, to come together against this activity. 
Because this is actually now an existential threat. As we mentioned, a human being can only go three days without water. And as it stands, Ghana Water Company has had to reduce its water supply by over 75%, which means a lot more of the 32 million people of Ghana do not have access to portable drinking water. We're saying if we have to indeed start importing water, the majority of the Ghanaian people cannot afford to import water, which actually means a lot of our people will be sentenced to death. So we're calling on every Ghanaian citizen, no matter which facet you belong to or which social class you belong to, this is a national call to duty for every single Ghanaian citizen that we need to join our forces together and make sure we put an end to this existential threat before it ends all of us. Thank you very much. Any other questions? The, right, yes, yes. So then if you listen to our earlier statement and when I was reading, I said this is actually not about whether it is legal or illegal. This goes beyond the law. This is about our existence. This is an existential threat as it stands. So if someone is doing it legally with their permit, but then their actions are actually destroying our water bodies, it does not matter whether it is legal or illegal. We're saying all mining activities, whether legal or illegal, must be put on hold. Let us find uh, uh, an immediate solution to our water situation, how we can secure our water, our water, right? And then we can go back to deciding who is legal and who is illegal, who is actually doing it with sustainable practices and all of those. But as it stands right now, we've gone past the legality or otherwise. We need to find a solution to this existential threat before it ends us. Yes. <clears throat> At the point attempted in uh, joining this uh, fight against Yes, sir. They claim that they are okay with the uh, actions which are the president, the meridional actions, yes. Uh, yes. Now, you lost labor in this fight. Right? Some, most of, some of them, yes. Some of them. Now, it's about numbers and it's about strength. Right. Now, your alternative in terms of numbers mobilization yes. would have to be effective organization. Right. Because they have the numbers. Now, it also appears you are fighting the opposition. How do you mobilize your strength? Right. So this is not a fight against anybody. It's against the enemies of the Ghanaian people. And the enemy of the Ghanaian people is anybody whose actions directly or indirectly affect the masses of the Ghanaian people negatively. That is who an enemy of the people is. So we made mention of the opposition and said they are largely a paid opposition but in our words, the most useless opposition because with their numerical strength in parliament, they've not been able to start any action in relation to the Galamse issue. We are saying anyone who is a Ghanaian citizen who cares about the situation and wants to do something about it must get involved in this. Even more so, the opposition. If you have the numerical strength in parliament and you're able to take direct action to influence some of these things, why are they silent? So we are calling out Anyone who has been silent but has the opportunity to do something about a problem but has chosen not to, we are calling out all of those people and say, shame on them. So this is not a fight against them, but this is a wake-up call to everyone who claims to be fighting in the interest of Ghana to show that support for Ghana as it stands now and not just pay lip service to the fight against Galamse. Thank you very much. Any more questions? <laughs>